So hello, welcome. Today we're talking about how to land your next RMI internship or job. I'm Sarah Kelsey. I'm the staff advisor for Gamma Iota Sigma and also the external relations coordinator for the risk management and insurance program here at CU Denver. And today we'll be given crash course. We'll be covering resumes, LinkedIn profiles, interview tips, distinguishing yourself as a candidate, as well as some different RMI careers. Bear with me, there was one more thing that I wanted to bring up real quick. Thanks for your patience. Alrighty. So, for resumes. I always like to start off reminding students that whether you're doing it for an internship or a job, resumes are super duper duper subjective. You could get advice from 20 different people, 100 different people, 500 different people. They would all give you different feedback on your resume. So I highly encourage you doing some research, figuring out what you're confident with, what works best for your style and how you wanna represent yourself. But I'm gonna show you a couple of different ways you can do that today. And one is going to be um, more of your in-school um, internship style resume. And another is gonna be more focused on folks that already have work experience just so you can get a little taste of each. Um, with these though, whether it is for an internship or a job, I always recommend just generally speaking, a few tips here to highlight your awards, including scholarships. I know that um, everyone on the call today is an RMI student. So I hope that whenever you're in a three credit hour risk course, that you're remembering to apply to those RMI scholarships. And we actually just sent out and notified winners of scholarships last week. Um, so be sure that you're adding those to your uh, resume and highlighting those in your summary at the top um, as you're getting those scholarship awards, especially if you were applying for an internship or a job at a company where you get a named scholarship. So a perfect example, we had a grad from last semester interviewing at Lockton and the per this person happened to get the named scholarship for Lockton previously. I told him put that front and center on the top of your resume that they know that you're a Lockton scholarship winner. Because a lot of times I'll get resumes from students that have gotten scholarships and they don't think to put those on. So highly, highly recommend that. Similarly with awards, I know there are lots of different awards that you can get at CU Denver. So like Dean's List, if you're getting um, awards and clubs that you're participating in or those sorts of things, great ideas to put those at the top of your summary as well. Um, anything like that. When I'm talking about to link or to not link, we're talking about your LinkedIn profile. And this is going back to the subjective comment up to you and kind of of your opinion and what you're comfortable with. But some great advice I received, you should only be putting your LinkedIn profile on your resume if the experience is similar to what you're listing on your, your resume itself. So you wanna make sure that again, to reiterate that your LinkedIn profile has similar experience to what you're listing on the resume yourself. So for instance, some, you can do different types of resumes, like you can do it in chronological order, or you could do it more of like a themed uh, subject type of resume where you may only list relevant experience. So in that type of resume, if you're going to have experience listed on your resume that, um, or not listed on your resume that's listed on your LinkedIn, then that may be a red flag for recruiters. So just make sure if you are calling attention to the LinkedIn profile on your resume that your resume experience matches up with it. And I would also only link it if you feel really confident about your LinkedIn profile and hopefully after the tips we go over today, you will. Um, but if you're thinking, oh, I don't have a great picture on there, it's this bathroom selfie, it's not a great look, don't link that to your resume either. 
When uh, discussing your GPA, I know that the business school template that I'll be bringing up here in a moment usually has students list their GPA. But I would say that you should not include it unless two things. One, unless you have a 4.0. I um, just graduated with my MBA last year and for a while I had a 4.0 and as soon as it dropped to less than a 4.0, my boss was like, take your GPA off of there, no one cares. And I felt really upset about it and personally <laughs> offended, but she was like, it's not personal. Um, I've been told this a hundred times. So definitely in the working world, that's kind of how they see things, unfortunately. But the caveat being to that is um, some internships, especially usually not jobs, will require a certain level of GPA. And obviously if the job or internship posting itself requires a certain GPA, then you will need to list that on your resume. Sometimes employers even want verification of your GPA. So keep in mind that you may need to provide um, a transcript or an official transcript or something like that in addition to listing it on your resume. For numbers, numbers, numbers. What I highly recommend to all students, another general tip here is to emphasize anything in your uh, work or volunteer experience that has numbers, data, or proven results. Anything that has numbers, be sure that you actually list the number instead of writing out the number in a word, because it's great to have those numbers uh, readily apparent when recruiters are reviewing your resumes. So for an example, um, a number that you could use is, um, you know, if you're a server, you could say, you know, my regularly um, hosted uh, guest and turn 200 tables a night or, or something like that. I'm probably screwing that up because I've never been a server before, but anything with numbers that you can do um, if you're in customer service, um, the amount of customers you deal with, um, if you're, you've done experience working books, um, the amount of files that you've reviewed, anything like that. And I'll, it, this will make more sense here when I show my resume momentarily. Last but not least, this is actually the most important bullet on the screen. I highly recommend that you update your resume for every single internship or job that you do. I know that can feel overwhelming or sound like a big task, but it can just be very slight tweaks. You may not actually change anything in the actual um, wording of your resume. You might just change the order of things. Um, you may not change the actual overall gist of the information you're saying. You may just change out a few of the words so that they are um, words that are listed on the actual internship or job posting that you're applying to. So when I say you need to change it for every single one, we're not, we're not starting from scratch. That, that's not what we're doing. I promise I'm not gonna make you redo your resume every time. These are just small minor tweaks that can help you stand out. And why this is really, really important is usually the first person who reviews your resume is not a person. Usually, especially for larger organizations, it's a bot that is screening your resume and they're doing keyword term searches and comparing your resume to other candidates by the amount of keyword terms that you have in your resume. So that's why it's really important that whenever you look at a job or internship posting that you cherry pick some words out of the actual job posting or internship posting like the requirements of the skills that they want you to have or that sort of thing. And you switch out some of the verbiage in your resume as you have it written to match that posting. Because that will bump you to the top of those bot lists. The more uh, keyword terms that you have, the more likely that you're gonna be at the top of the candidate pool and the more likely you're actually gonna get that call from that recruiter, or that HR manager, once a, a person's reviewing it. I wanna pause and in just a moment, I'm gonna pull up a couple resume examples so we can kind of discuss that in more detail using real world examples. But before I do, any questions on those items, what we've covered so far?
And it's totally okay if not to. Nothing, okay, perfect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull up a couple different resumes. Thanks, Caleb, you're so sweet. So one of these resumes is gonna look super familiar. Um, it's going to be the kind of form that they use for RMI in the business school. And the other is actually going to be my resume. I updated it recently preparing for the workshop. So you guys kind of see what it looks like when you have some more experience here. And I'm just, my PowerPoint is being weird. Sorry guys, here we go. Alrighty. So I know that a lot of folks are familiar with the RMI format, so I thought that I'd go ahead and share mine first here. And I will reiterate that th this resume, I would change it. If I was actively applying for a job, I would change it for any posting that I apply to. So for this version, I uh, have stuck with my education at the top because I just graduated with my MBA in operations management. So that's really what's most important to my experience right now. I do mine with having relevant experience as a section. And then I separate out other experience because I did more, uh, I, I was a, a K through 12 art teacher for a year after college. And then I also was a hostess of the Broadmoor, which doesn't really have anything to do with risk management or insurance. So I kind of separated that out into a different section. Um, but you'll notice that I have a lot of different numbers. So anything that I could think of um, numbers wise, I highlight that there throughout the bullet points. Um, you'll notice that my relevant experience has a lot more bullets and detail than my other, not irrelevant, but other experience. And you'll notice that I keep my leadership and activities short, sweet to the point, but that um, sometimes like if you have enough room, especially, you'll add bullets to your um, leadership and activities as well. Um, but some things that I wanted to point out, um, with my education and also my jobs, I have chosen to not list the city locations. This is because if you are actively searching for an internship or job in a different place from where your experience is listed, then you may be automatically booted off of recruiters list for getting an interview. And, and the goal of a resume is to get an interview. Your resume is not to get you the job. It's to highlight the best things that you can about your experience to get an interview. If you are applying to various positions and you're not getting an initial phone call, then that's probably a sign that there's something that you need to tweak on your resume. But again, going back to what I was saying, I don't list the uh, cities where my job experiences are. Personal preference, I know that the template that we have at the business school tells you to do that, but I would especially not do it if you're looking to get a job elsewhere. Like if you're planning on moving out of state, especially um, when you're graduating, I would not list cities. The other thing that I've chosen to do is I put the organization at the top of my experience. And then I have my titles underneath the organization. And that's especially important for this USAA experience, for example, because if I just had the title of my last job at USAA, since I was there for five years, it would look like I didn't have any um, movement that I just stayed in the same role the whole time. And it's really important if you do get promoted or move into a different role, get into a specialty team, that you separate out those titles to show um, growth. 
if you don't um, have promotions or if you are in the same title um, at the same place, that is totally fine as well. Um, I know that a lot of people will do that, you know, staying in school, for instance, you guys are, are students right now. You're focusing on school, not work. So it's totally fine if you don't have movement or different titles, but make sure to highlight it if you do. The other thing, um, another thing that I wanted to highlight we were on this format um, is for experience that doesn't really relate to the job or industry that you're in currently or that you want to get into, you can keep the uh, bullets short, sweet, to the point. But for any section where you have bullets, you want to have multiple. So even though hostess at the Broadmoor restaurant doesn't have anything to do with RMI, I still listed at least two bullets because if you're going to list bullets, you need to do multiple. So the other thing you'll notice, I have it on one page. It's also best um, if you can to get it all onto one page. Um, that may not be possible if you have lots of experience or if um, you decide you want to get into academia. I know that academics have multiple page resumes, so it may be a totally different format as you get older. So that's how I do mine. You'll also notice perhaps that we're looking at this via PDF. You'll also want to do that for any of your resumes, cover letters, things that you're creating and submitting for a job application. Save it as a PDF because then the formatting is correct. <laughs> it, my cat wants to say hello. Hi. <laughs> but if you save it as a Word document, um, you've probably noticed when you're doing group assignments that formatting can get, change or get funky between Mac and PC. So you always, always, always save things as a PDF. Um, there is an option when you go to save as in Word to save it as a PDF. So that way you know that your formatting is going to be uh, the correct no matter how you look at it. Alrighty, any questions on this? Perfect. Alrighty. Switching around to a new share real quick. My computer's dragging, sorry guys. Here we go. So for the RMI resume, I'm actually going to share my screen with a web page first. My computer wants to cooperate. Here we go. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, we have an RMI opportunities page. Also, can you hear me okay? I got a warning when I was bringing up my computer that my connection was unstable. Am I still okay? Yes, we can now, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Start waving at me if I cut out. So on this RMI opportunities page, it has a lot of different resources on here, including this RMI sample resume. So I just wanted to show you if you didn't know where it was at, that is where you can find it. This is the opportunities page that's linked from our opportunity roundup every week. And that is for RMI majors, minors, program students. So if you are, are not in the program, you may not be familiar with this page, which is totally okay. Please feel free to reach out to me about more information about the RMI program. When you click on it, you'll notice it opens up a PDF for students. So this is especially smart for any kind of internship resume format. You have your first and last name. They do recommend city state. That's totally fine as long as you're 
part of me just about to <laughs> Sorry, you guys. The animals are all over the place today. Um, it does have a sticky state at this top. I think that's totally fine if you're applying for a remote position or uh, in the same city as where you live currently. Again, with the LinkedIn profile, you'll want to make sure that your experience on LinkedIn is similar to what you have on your resume if you're linking it. The objective is not something you always need to include on the top of your resume. That is mainly for if you're wanting to get into a new industry. So like I know that we have a lot of folks that already have ex uh, experience as in the um, hospitality industry, for instance. So if you're trying to transfer from hospitality over to RMI, that's a great place to put an objective statement like the one we have here. Um, it's a great uh, thing to include for internships. But again, you'll want to make sure you'll update it for each job. You don't want to apply for an underwriting internship and have an objective that says you want a, an agency internship, for instance. Just make sure it matches with your goals. Objectives are also good if you're trying to move. So if you're graduating and you're wanting to get to a different city, it's a great place to put that as well. Summary of qualifications. You'll notice mine, my resume did not have a summary, but it's great for uh, students, especially if you don't have as much prior work experience. Um, you'll change this up and you'll want to highlight the things that are most relevant for the position that you're applying for. You'll notice that this one for education has your GPA. I would remove that unless it is a requirement for the position. And again, up to you about the city state, but keep in mind what we've talked about already. This at the bottom, instead of having leadership activities, it has RMI involvement and community service. I highly recommend leaving RMI involvement listed on there and highlighting things that um, relate to RMI. So putting that you're a GIS member or officer. Um, these are great examples that we have here on the example um, or on the example resume. Um, if you're a RIMS member, those sorts of things. Any questions on the more student oriented resume format? Perfect. Moving right I along. Do you have a question? Yeah. I have a absolutely. question. Uh, First, first of all, I'm very sorry I've been late. Uh, I had a no meeting worries. right over. No <laughs> uh, and my question would be, you said that the LinkedIn profile and the uh, CV should be quite similar. Mm -hmm. uh, how similar should they be? Meaning, um, I have a couple of, mm -hmm. of applications I want to send out that um, said I should explicitly point out my, uh, like my profile, I would say. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Obviously, my profile is different for every application. For sure. um, so do I use LinkedIn as a, as, a, as a broader CV, I would say? I think that's a good call. Um, we're going to cover LinkedIn profiles here next. But mainly oh, on that, oh, no, don't be sorry at all. That's a great yeah. question. What I would say is um, where I've heard that it's bad to link the resume to the LinkedIn is if um, your resume has doesn't have experience that your LinkedIn does. So like it may be a red flag that the recruiter thinks you're trying to hide experience um, mm -hmm. from them for whatever reason that you have listed on your LinkedIn, that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it does. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I had a question for you as well, Sarah, uh, yeah. just um, regarding that resume format that you just screen share shared for us. Yeah. So in that specific example, it had an objective portion listed at the top. Mm -hmm. I've used those on like basically all of my resumes in the past, but just recently I've started hearing from recruiters that um, objective statements might not be the best to use because everybody that's submitting a resume kind of has the same objective, whether it be to get a job or to get an internship. Mm -hmm. So is that is that true? Is that something that you've heard from either recruiters or just on a general basis? Another really good question. Um, if you're not trying to transfer to a different industry than your experience list, 
or transfer to a different location than your experience list, I would probably not use an objective statement because you're exactly right. Usually those are pretty canned and similar between candidates. When it is useful is if um, what you're looking for is different than what your experience shows, if that makes sense. Okay, so basically if you're like trying to transfer skills from one um, like sector to another. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's a very good clarification. I appreciate you. Yeah. yeah, those are good questions, guys. Keep them coming. And hopefully some of these overlap in between because we'll also um, be talking about how to distinguish yourself as a candidate. So we'll be uh, touching back on resumes a little bit more too as we go into other sections. Sweet. So for the next part, we were gonna go ahead and discuss LinkedIn profiles. And for this, I actually updated my LinkedIn so we can uh, give you some tips on, on what to do with it. Alrighty. So we'll cover a few different things on LinkedIn. First thing, I want to highlight, and I'm getting another warning, my connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? I'm going to turn off my camera while I'm yeah. sharing screen, just to be on the safe side. I think it's just like the moment in which you try to connect. Like, okay, perfect. Thank you. So with LinkedIn, you definitely want to use it right now in our time of COVID and the pandemic and everyone working remotely and stuff for connections. Like uh, John and I were talking earlier about the regional conference. Um, if you go to events like that where you listen to panelists or speakers, make sure that you're adding those folks on LinkedIn afterwards to grow your network. Um, this is especially important as a student. Uh, industry partners and professionals are a lot more likely to connect with you and help you out and answer questions for you as a student. So connect as much as you can. And then for your profile, we're going to highlight a few different things. Um, first, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, make sure you create one as soon as possible. <laughs> I'm hoping that you all already have a LinkedIn. Once you do, make sure that you have a professional looking photo. And it doesn't actually have to be done by a professional. It can be really easy. Um, the cameras and smartphones nowadays are so top of the line that you could even take it with your smartphone. Just make sure you're doing it with a neutral background. And I highly recommend doing it outside on a neutral background outside. So like in front of a tree or something with good lighting. So usually lighting, if you wanna be nerdy about it is either at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. And uh, make sure that you're dressed in something professional, um, that you look clean cut and that it's about portrait uh, length, if you will. So similar to mine, you don't want it too close to your face. You don't want it too zoomed out. Pretty straightforward to the point. I also recommend updating this cover photo behind your profile picture. I've seen some people that get really fancy about it and they put a picture in their profile cover that relates to their about section which is really cool. I'm not that cool, but if you are, I give you mad props. Um, so you'll wanna make sure the pictures are updated. This is called your like little headline. Um, I just have it as my uh, title, but sometimes you can do something fancy there, especially as a student. Like I've seen one student who's like, um, what's your risk appetite? Or like things like that, that are kind of interesting and intention grabbing. Um, but yeah, I would say either go with a title or something interesting and attention grabbing. You want to avoid things like um, current student looking for work or looking for an internship or we're going to, I'm going to show you here in just a moment how you can show recruiters that you're open for work. So you don't want to include those sorts of things in your headline. While we're on that subject, you'll notice that LinkedIn helps you out and they give you some tips right here. And they should show up when you view your own profile as well. So you'll notice that you can show recruiters that you're open to work. 
if you click on this, you can actually put what kind of work that you're looking for, where you're looking at um, location-wise, that you're open to remote work, um, that you want to start immediately, or if you're casually browsing. So you'll definitely, definitely, definitely want to update this if you're actively searching for a job or internship. Moving right along for your about section. Um, there are a few different ways you can handle this. I picked out my top four bullets of what I thought were the most important or interesting things about my experience. I've seen folks that again can tie it into their cover uh, picture. That's been pretty interesting. Um, so there are a few different ways that you can handle this one, but you wanna have something that's interesting that makes you stand out. Um, you don't wanna do something that's like, I'm a current student and I'm looking for an internship. Try to avoid things like that. Um, what is the, oh. go ahead. What is the general rule of thumb for size for the about section? Um, I would say no more than a paragraph or a handful of bullets. Thank you. Yeah, good question. There's also a section that you can add that's called featured. And I did this because um, like there was an article about the program that I featured. And then there was also a Zoom webinar panel that I hosted that the business school did an article about. Um, not necessary to do this section, but if you have things like that where you've had an article written about you, you've hosted an event, anything like that, those are cool things to put in the featured section. Um, your dashboard is something that you will have access to when you look at your profile. Um, it will show you um, who's viewed your pr profile, uh, how many people have looked at your posts. So that's kind of just interesting to know, especially when you're on a job search. Activity shows anything that you've done online in the past 90 days. So I've been bad. I haven't been very active on LinkedIn, but I highly encourage you to be active, active, active if you are searching for a position. So getting out, commenting on things, liking people's posts, um, making slight tweaks to your uh, LinkedIn profile as well can all put you at the top of recruiters lists. The more active you are, the more recently you've updated your profile, that will push you to the top of recruiters lists on their end. And one way that you can be more active is you can talk or you can get added to groups and we'll uh, come back to that. But there are uh, definitely groups that you can join on LinkedIn um, and you can kind of comment and stuff in those groups um, that would be helpful to you. Plus, you can make more connections through those groups as well. For the experience, I have mine set up in the same format as my resume. But I don't list as many bullets. So you'll pro you probably remember that my resume bullets were just a bit more detailed. I cut a little bit, um, but I kept most of what I had on my resume. Um, at the very minimum, you'll at least want to have like your title, where you worked, and the range of time that you worked there. Um, but it's great if you can include uh, a few bullets as well. And usually, like I did, you can just copy and paste from your resume. So it makes it pretty straightforward. Um, for this, I recommend, since you don't have to worry about the one page limits like you do your resume, including everything that you've ever done work experience wise, with the exception being like now, you know, I graduated from my undergrad in 2013. So come up on eight years out of school now. I just have my position since I graduated from my undergrad. I don't have any of my stuff before that. Make sure you have your education up to date. Don't forget to update that when you graduate. There are so many uh, people that I see that it looks like they're still in school for like 10 years, but they graduated a long time ago. So make sure you remember to do that. Licenses and certifications. This is really cool. As a CU Denver student, you have access to LinkedIn Learning. So you can actually take courses through LinkedIn Learning. And when you do, those certs will post on your profile. So it, there's a wide range of stuff you can do. You can do stuff about 
um, the Microsoft Suite Access Database, um, Emotional Intelligence, like there's a whole wide range of stuff. Highly recommend if you have time doing those courses and you get those certifications on there. You can also add volunteer experience. Uh, a note on that, like I wouldn't put the one time you volunteered at Food Bank of the Rockies. I, I try to volunteer there at least a couple of times a month, which is why I have that listed. Um, if you're listing volunteer stuff, it should be something that you're doing on a regular basis. And there are other special sections you can do at the bottom. You can um, take an assessment to have skills and endorsements listed. Other people can confirm that you have certain skills. Um, it's kind of fun to do that with connections in your network just to help each other out. And even you can add organizations and languages. So for all these funny sections, anything you wanna add, you can just click on the pencil in the section that you wanna update. Or for adding sections, you just add profile section and it'll give you a full list of everything um, that you can add to your profile. Any questions on profiles while we're on here? I'm going to show you guys LinkedIn groups here in just a moment. I kind of have a question related to like what to put in your experience. Um, how, like I heard different opinions on adding uh, while you're like an undergraduate or like still in school, like your positions, for example, or like your involvement in different organizations mm -hmm. as an experience. Do you have any comments or like recommendations on that? That's a great question. So when I add my organizations, I actually did it through the section at the bottom called um, accomplishments. So if you don't have that already on there, you just add profile section under accomplishments. And then you, there's a whole list of things. You can put publications, patents. As a student, you can list courses. That would be a really great thing to do. Um, but you can also do organizations. So when I've done that, unfortunately it doesn't show up very well, but you could have accomplishments. It's, you can see I have five different organizations listed. And if you click the carrot, it, it says all the different titles I've had in those organizations. Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Perfect. Moving right along. So I mentioned groups. Um, there's a section, if this is just the homepage of your LinkedIn, there's a section over here called groups. Um, when you click on it, you can see all the groups that you're a member of. Usually that this is through things that you do activity wise, like in SureTech Denver, I attended a couple of their events. So that's how I'm a part of that group. QGrads is something that you have access to as a uh, CU Denver RMI student. So QGrads is something that you can request to join that group. Great networking. Um, they can help you with your resume LinkedIn. Um, they have coffee hours every Wednesday at three our time, I believe. So it's a great way to network outside of the school. Um, Colorado Prima, I'm a member of their local chapter, which you can join too as a student. So that's how I'm a member of that. She Travels is a group with travelers through a conference I attended. Um, and ALM Young Professionals, that was recommended through another industry group. So long story short, I highly encourage you to join our industry association groups and find out more about groups you can join on LinkedIn. Sweet. Moving back to our PowerPoint. Alrighty. We're covering interview tips. We were just talking about LinkedIn. I said we might overlap section some. some. Make sure you connect with your interviewers on LinkedIn or at the very least creep on them. Yes, I'm actively encouraging you to creep on your interviewers. They are impressed and it can help stand, make you stand out as a candidate if you know a little bit about your interviewer's experience and you can bring that up in your interview. 
Like for example, when I interviewed for this position, I had looked at uh, our director's profile and I knew that he had come from the corporate world into higher education, which is what I was doing. So I was able to kind of banter with him about that in my interview. Um, know the position organization well. Why are you passionate about them? Why do you want this job? Why do you want to work for this organization? This is super important. I've gotten general feedback from one of our industry partners recently that she was surprised because some of our students did not have a LinkedIn profile and that none of them knew about her and none of them knew about the organization. Those are definitely big no-nos when interviewing. Um, you want to know things, look at, you know, just do a Google search. Have they showed up in the news recently? What are their core values? How do you fit into their core values? What are you passionate about their core values and mission? Um, are there certain things that are passions for you that um, relate to their uh, core initiatives? Like for instance, um, I was an art studio major in undergrad. And when I was looking at jobs at Progressive once, I noticed that they have this big art division where they uh, sponsor a lot of different uh, art uh, shows and things. So if I was interviewing with them, I could bring that up. You'll wanna show that you know your, your stuff about the company and the job or internship. I also heard great advice that you wanna emphasize you want a career in RMI. Um, you know, plenty of people are looking for a job Think about why you want a career, why you see yourself with, you know, an RMI job in the long term. You want to be early for your interviews, whether it's in person or online, make sure you're joining early. So if it's in online, make sure that you get on the meeting at least five minutes early. I would recommend 10 or 15 minutes early. Um, you know, you never know when you're going to run into tech issues either. So if you're having issues getting in, you'll for sure be on time. Same for in-person. You'll want to aim to get there at least 15 minutes early, ideally. And I mentioned virtual and in-person because there are other things. You're going to prep for a virtual interview differently than you are an in-person interview. For virtual, you're going to want to make sure whatever platform you're using for the interview is working correctly. So whether it's WebEx, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, make sure that you're comfortable with the software program in advance. I also, this is really nerdy, but I usually will get into like a private room, like my own personal room in Zoom or whatever, and actually turn on my video and look at my lighting, look at my background and make sure that I look 1001%. You wanna be on top of your game. So make sure you're in a quiet space, that you're not, not going to have, you know, distractions, that you have good lighting, those sorts of things. I also recommend, obviously in our virtual world, we can get away with uh, business on top, sweatpants on the bottom, but I highly recommend being dressed professionally head to toe because it just gets you more in the interview mindset game. For in-person, you're going to want to make sure you know where the location is at in advance. So if it's in a part of town you're not comfortable with, you don't, you're not familiar with, you're not sure about parking, I would drive to the actual location and make sure you get that all figured out before the day of your interview. Any questions on interview tips? Awesome. We're going to touch on it again here in a moment because next we're going to talk about distinguishing yourself. So this is really important in an interview um, with regarding how you're answering questions as well as doing an elevator pitch. So for answers to questions, usually interviews are going to give you five main question types. It's going to relate to a difficult uh, customer or colleague, um, teamwork, leadership, um, like professional development, and customer service. So, so one thing I recommend is 
if you want to distinguish yourself in an interview, having stories or examples of your experience that fit in those general categories and have answers already prepared in a format that either that star or situation behavior outcome. But basically you're going to explain the situation, what the issue or problem was at hand, what you did to address it. And then you're also going to talk about the results that you delivered on. And just like your resume, if you can include results that have numbers in them, it makes you stand out even more. Why I talked about it, about distinguishing yourself. It's not a requirement to do that in interviews by any means. It just will help you stand out. Then when you're answering those questions too, once you've answered all the questions at the end of the interview and the interview asks you, do you have any questions for me? Think of at least one question that you can relate your elevator pitch to. So like for instance, I was interviewing for a position for a property adjuster one and I asked my interviewers, what are the best qualities that you look for in this type of role? And then after they answered, I was able to tie that into my elevator pitch and it's just a 30 second to one minute quick synopsis of why you are the best person for the position. And the best advice I ever got about doing one of those is if you don't feel a little greasy, you're doing it wrong. You're, it's weird to talk about yourself positively. I know it feels awkward and weird. You don't want to like brag about yourself. Like in society, it's not like we're taught like, yeah, you should go around and talk about how awesome you are. But you do want to do that with your elevator pitch. And again, kind of like we've already talked about, you'll want to tailor it for the actual position. So it'll be slightly different for each position or interview uh, you do. With that, you're going to think about what makes you special and unique. A couple other things that can help distinguish yourself. You always want to make sure you interview or email your interviewers after interviews and thank them for their time. Re attach a copy of your resume for their reference and say you're, re you're really looking forward to hearing from them about the position and you're really excited about the, the opportunity to join their team. I put handwritten notes in a question mark because probably not applicable now um, with COVID, but when people are back in the office, if you wanna go above and beyond, you can even do a handwritten thank you that you mail to their office address. So I have a question for you, Sarah. Yeah. In regards to those um, thank you emails post-interview, what is like proper etiquette for time frame, like post interview, like is it like 24 hours after or, you know, a couple of days? What would you suggest um, as far as timing? I would say within 24 hours, even the same day is fine. You won't want to send it like immediately after your interview, <laughs> but like yeah. that afternoon is totally a fair game. Okay, perfect. So just like within the same day, maybe. Within the same day is ideal, but like if you have like a later in the day interview, then it may be the next morning. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, good question. I also have a question in regards to the thank you emails. Yeah. Um, so how short and brief does it need to be? So can you discuss things that you talked about in the interview in the thank you email? So like, yeah. for example, saying I enjoyed hearing you speak on this. Yeah, I think that's great. If you can point to something specific in the interview, for sure. You just want to be brief about it. Like I would say no more than a paragraph, a few sentences is ideal. Okay. Short, sweet to yeah. the point. Yeah, good question. Any other questions on interviews or anything we've covered so far? Perfect. I know I kind of switched up the time frame a little bit. I thought that I would do like 30 minute quick uh, workshop in the beginning. And then I realized I would really like to go into that in more detail and then go through our my careers pretty quickly. So I hope that's that's okay with everyone that I, I did that. Um, 
for RMI careers, I cannot emphasize enough that there are so many things that you can do in risk management and insurance. The sky is the limit. Um, no matter what your personality type is, you're going to find something that, you know, you're interested in. Everything that you can think of in this world needs insurance in some form. Um, your apartment, your house, your personal belongings, your car, um, all companies and organizations need insurance. Um, they have insurance for sporting events. Uh, if you're into uh, antique cars, there's special insurance for that. Any kind of interest or hobby that you can think of, there's going to be some form of insurance dealing with it for music. Uh, you know, musicians need their instruments insured. The uh, venues need insurance for concerts. The sky is the limit. All kinds of organizations need risk management. I really don't mean to throw the kitchen sink at you, but there's so many different options. I will end with just a brief story of my experience in the industry. I was a property claims adjuster for USA for almost five years. And one thing that is great about the industry is they are competing for top talent. So they have such great benefits. Um, my MBA was paid for. Uh, USAA had tuition reimbursement for up to 10 grand a year. So I didn't pay a dime of my MBA. Um, they usually have really good 401k matches. Um, there are uh, plenty of companies that really like you getting certified and like your CPCU or ARMS designation. So professional designations, they'll pay for it. USA likes CPCU so much that they would give you bonuses for completing it. They would pay for you and one other person to go to the CPCU annual conference to receive your designation in person. I mean, that's not just USA. That's pretty typical for any of the larger organizations in RMI. So highly, it's a great industry to get into. About half the industry is getting ready to retire within the next 10 years. So lots of jobs are coming available. Um, any kind of uh, other interests that you have. I know that we have a lot of double majors on here. They're also looking for finance people, marketing people, managers, I mean, you name it. So uh, it's a great time to get into RMI. Any questions about careers? Oh, before I, I ask you that, and I'll stay on late for anyone who has additional questions. Um, I get asked a lot, okay, like what, um, kind of, uh, experience should I have, you know, what kind of internship do I need to do? Are there other tests or certifications I need to do in order to get an entry level job? The, uh, the one last piece of advice I have for you is looking at job postings now and just doing research, figuring out what kind of jobs sound interesting and keeping job alerts open for those jobs so that you can see in real life, you know, for if you want to be an underwriter, what are different organizations wanting for an entry level underwriter position? So that way you can start planning now before you graduate if they do want additional things or if there are certifications or things that can help you because what they're wanting for an underwriter at USAA is going to be totally different than Zurich or Lockton. So um, looking at those positions in real uh, life and seeing what they want is the best way to kind of figure those sorts of questions out. But yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. I know we're at time, so I'll let everyone go, um, but I will hang out for anyone who has additional questions or anything of that nature. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a fantastic presentation. That was great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, guys. It's great to see you. Caleb, uh, did you have anything you wanted to say to members before we say goodbye? Did we already have a chance to present the point system? By chance? Oh, we had, we had not had a chance yet. And I know we're at time. Um, um, do you have it available? Do you want to try sharing it or should we just send it out via email? Uh, yeah, I can actually have it pulled up here in like two seconds. So basically, so um, we did uh, implement a point system based on attendance, various other things for ours to 
start accruing points over the course of this semester, uh, with the end being a um, if, if um, members a certain amount of points, then they will receive a GIS brand North Face backpack. So I'll actually uh, screen share with you guys um, real quick and show you what that point system looks like. Sorry, my computer's being a little bit slow, but. That's totally okay. That's While you're pulling up, do you mind if we take a quick picture for social media, Caleb? Absolutely. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Three, two, one. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. So I will go ahead and share my screen, guys. All right, so this is going to be our point system. So if you look at the bullet points, so these are going to be the various things that you as members of GIS can get points for over the course of the semester. So for instance, if you attend a meeting like you did today, you just got five points for joining us today for our meeting. Um, in the future, if you see a meeting that looks interesting and you wanna bring a friend to it, you get two points just for bringing a friend along. And if they sign up for GIS, then that is an additional three points for you. Uh, later in April, uh, around the second week in April, we'll be doing a risky run virtual 5K. And for all of our members that participate in that, five points and so on. So if you see there are like a lot of different things you can get uh, points for over the course of the semester, I would definitely provide this uh, via email to all of our chapter members so you guys can have this in your possession and see what things you might want to try to get some points for. But if you look towards the bottom, so for members who achieve 30 points over the course of the semester, they will receive a GIS logo North Face backpack. And so this is a super cool opportunity for you to get, um, you know, a little bit of GIS swag for yourself. Um, we are planning on doing about uh, six meetings, including this one today, over the course of the semester. So if you do, if you just attend all of our meetings, then you get yourself a backpack. If you miss a few meetings, uh, you can do things like participate in the virtual 5K or go to an RMI event. So there are definitely a lot of opportunities for you guys to get some points over the course of the semester. And then for our members with the top three point rankings, um, there's kind of like a tiered reward system as listed on there. So we just wanted to basically provide you guys with um, an incentive system to uh, get you active and participating in some of the really awesome um, and beneficial events that we have over the course of this semester. So like I said, I will definitely shoot this out to all of you guys via email. Um, I, I can do that as soon as we hop off of our meeting tonight and so you can just take a peek at it you know see what kind of things look interesting to you and yeah thank you so much yes thank you so much we're really excited and like i said i'll hang out for anyone who has any additional questions or anything well, thank you for your time and effort in your presentation today, Sarah. I appreciate you.